What is mastering and why should you care about it? How does it affect you and your home recording? Well, it breaks down like this. There's three things we're going to cover here. I'm going to give you the elevator pitch around what mastering is actually all about. And then we're going to go into a little bit of the history of mastering and then the important stuff, some quick tips that are going to help you take your final mix and turn it into an epic final master. So what is mastering? Well, mastering is adding those final touches to your final stereo mix to make it competitive and comparable with other songs. It's what we call radio ready, even though very few people listen to the radio anymore. But imagine that your song is in a playlist. There's a Foo Fighters tune, and then there's your song, and then there's a Drake tune. And you want to make sure that your song doesn't stand out like a sore thumb. If you've got a final mixed version and you haven't done some of the things we're going to talk about in a moment, it may be that theirs is coming along at this volume, yours just sounds dead and lifeless and too quiet, and then the next track kicks in. So the main purpose of mastering is to make sure that when you are releasing your music, that it is the best it can possibly be. Now, it can include things like EQ, stereo widening, multiband compression, but primarily limiting or brick wall or peak limiting is what you're going to do the most of when it comes to mastering. And we'll talk about what that is in a moment. Now, the key goal of mastering is really to lift the overall output volume up to zero dB. So if your volume is lower than that, lower than the maximum volume, the first thing you'll do is kind of normalize that volume up to zero dB. And then you're going to actually limit it. So you're pulling up some of those quieter parts to make the overall sound. Now, you can go too far with this. We don't want to completely remove all the dynamic range from our mix or our master. We'll talk about that in a moment. But let's talk about the history, because I like learning where things came from. The history of mastering. You've probably heard of a master tape. So in the past, what would happen is that you would mix, and then you would need to create a master. So you would, the mix engineer would have all the, the mix there ready on the console. They'd run a master tape. They'd record down a master version. And that is what they would use to press their records and cassettes, and eventually CDs could all be produced from that one master. Now, you're probably familiar with the term remaster. That's where the original mix is then mastered again using maybe some newer technology, some different plugins. And remixing is different, although like most things in recording, the two terms are kind of interchanged sometimes these days. But technically, a remaster is still using the exact same tracks, the exact same mix, but just adding some different mastering plugins. So how does that translate to the digital world? Why do we need a master now? Well, technically we don't. We obviously don't need a master tape, but we do need a master file, a final stereo wave file, which is the file that we're going to then distribute, that you're going to upload to SoundCloud or distribute to Spotify, Apple Music, iTunes, using your YouTube videos. You want the highest quality master file that you can actually have. But it doesn't need to be a tape, it just needs to be a file. Now, there are some people that don't even master, and we'll talk about that in a moment and why that is the case. So, do you need to master these days? Well, the short answer is no, because a lot of your digital audio workstations will actually have a master track or a master bus, a master fader that you can add mastering plugins to. So here's what you do. You get your final mix together and then you're like, yep, there's my final mix. You leave a little bit of headroom. We'll talk about that in a moment. And then you master that track simply by adding mastering plugins to the master bus. So really, you don't need to. Now, I prefer having my mastering, my final mix, exported as a stereo wave file and then imported back in so that I can add it just to that stereo wave file. The reason being is that when you've got your entire mix there, the temptation is to go back and start changing individual tracks. Now, there's nothing wrong with that, but that's the mixing process. I like to have a complete end to mixing and then just do mastering. Otherwise, it tends to never end. So when you've got your final mix, if you're doing your mastering, and you're finding that you're needing to adjust a whole lot of stuff, maybe you need to go back to that final mix and do some more tweaking before you actually master. Let's talk about the practical side of this. As I mentioned, all I do is export my stereo file from my DAW, from GarageBand, from Reaper, from Pro Tools, <coughs> from wherever you're recording. And then you can either do two things. You can use some software, some specialized mastering software, or you can simply use the digital audio workstation you're already using. If you're using GarageBand even, or I don't even, if you're using GarageBand or any other DAW, just bring it back in as a stereo track and then 
all you're doing is adding those plugins to that stereo track, that one track, instead of having to add it to all the different individual components. So that is how you can actually master is just bring it in, add your limiter, add your EQ, add your other plugins and do those things. Now, as I mentioned here, there are other things you can do. Limiter, often called a peak, peak limiter or a brick wall limiter. What that'll do is raise up the audio, but it will limit it, hence the name, at zero dB. That's to stop it from going over and clipping or peaking or distorting your signal. So that is the main thing that you're doing with a master, is to make sure it's competitive at a competitive volume. There's a couple of things you can do wrong. You can obviously under limit, which is what I was talking about before. Your mix won't be competitive. It won't sound good because it won't be at a loudness level that is going to be competitive with others. You can go too far the other way. You can over limit, over compress. And you would have heard this sound. It starts pumping. You start getting that pumping sound or you start still getting some distortion because the brick wall limiter can only do so much. It's like, I cannot do no more, Captain, all those sort of things. It can only do so much with that. So other plugins that you can add in there, like I said, if you want to tweak the EQ, tweak the EQ. If you want to use other fancy harmonizer or saturation plugins, use some trial and error. Have some fun with this. But remember, all of the moves in mastering should be little tiny tweaks, similar to the, the, um, the old adage that if you've got a bad recording, you can't fix it in the mix. You can't take a crappy recording and suddenly it's epic because of all the mixing voodoo that you do. It's the same with a master. Don't take your final mix and then expect that if it's terrible, you can just master your way out of it. Fix it in the mix and then come into the master. So I'm going to end with this and this is something that uh, Ian Shepard, great mastering engineer, says a lot about mastering and that is do no harm. So the final point on mastering is you should be really conscious to not actually harm your final mix. So whatever you do in mastering, it should be to enhance the good work you've already done. It shouldn't be to reinvent the wheel and do brand new things to completely change the song. If you've recorded it well, if you've mixed it well, your mastering should be a simple, straightforward process that is simply enhancing all of the good work that you've already done.